Music and math. Math and music. <laughs> math and music are often described as being so closely connected that they're almost synonymous. One well-known composer, mathematician, and educator, Joseph Schillinger, said, music is math and math is music. There's no shortage of literature on the subject of mathematics and music. You can find mathematical analysis of just about any musical genre from classical to punk to hip hop to jazz to the simplest folk music. So is all music really actually math? Is all music all math? Or is some music just part math and part something else? Should you concern yourself with how much of your music is math and how much of it isn't? There's no question that math can be and is applied to music. After all, the spacing on the frets of this guitar are determined by the mathematical ratio of the 12th root of 2 over 1. We all know this. Or 1.05946 dot 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 to 1 which is the ratio of the diatonic half-step in the Western musical system. And someone had to figure that out mathematically. But is music itself math? I mean, is music math? Just depends on what the meaning of the word is is, I guess. Hmm, I'll have to remember that. That's good. Are you using math even when you don't know it? Now, I'm not going to argue against ever applying math to music, but what I will question is just how necessary math is in the process of making and understanding music. I'd also like to clarify exactly what is meant by math when the term is applied to practical music theory. Counting and measuring are considered math only in the most rudimentary sense. On a practical level, most of us hardly think of these things as math at all. If we're talking about math here, we're talking about first grade math, the same math that tells you the difference between a pint and a gallon and a quart. <laughs> the same math that tells you that 12 o'clock is the middle of the day. Certainly, when we describe rhythms in music, it's a clear application of that very simple math really just arithmetic. We count measures of music as units of time divided into beats. The most common unit is a measure of four beats. We call this 4-4 four, four time, or actually common time. And we use this time signature to indicate how the beats are counted. The number on top indicates how many beats there are per measure, and the number on the bottom, the lower number, indicates the type of note symbol that represents one beat. Might we distinguish between using numbers for labeling, counting, and measuring on one hand, and things like algebra and trigonometry, calculus on the other hand? When you're first learning about music theory and you hear the phrase, music is mathematical, how do you know what's really meant by that? When it comes to music theory, we can pretty much do without anything more complicated than counting and measuring. The numbers in a musical time signature are labels for structural ideas. Though we can still say they're mathematical in some sense of the word, they are defining mathematical divisions of time after all, but it's not the language of math that you'd learn in any math class. Instead, it's a more technical language where numbers are often used to represent types of objects, like you might refer to a number two pencil, or the numbers on billiard balls, or perhaps the gear numbers on a stick shift. One is the lowest, five is the highest. But those numbers don't tell you the precise gear ratios. Those might even differ from one car to another. These are not mathematical numbers, they're only labels to help you know what gear to use for different driving conditions. The numbers in time signatures are labels. Although they may look like math, they function in a way that is unique to music. This function needs to be understood on its own terms. Now, we've all heard of Ludwig van Beethoven. 
You can find plenty of college-level mathematical analysis of his music, and you can find many scholars explaining how the maestro employed math in his great compositions. Except that if you look for any actual math in Beethoven's manuscripts, or in any of his many letters and notebooks, you won't find it. Why? Because Beethoven was almost mathematically illiterate. He was so bad at basic multiplication and division that they say if he wanted to multiply two numbers, like 52 and 60, he'd write 60 on the page 52 times and add it up. Beethoven struggled through trial and error to refine his musical ideas. He worked and reworked his manuscripts, sketching out an idea, crossing it out, revising it, crossing it out, revising it again, over and over on the page. What's missing from these manuscripts is any reference to math in any form in Beethoven's hand. Let's focus on the relevant facts and not impute causality when it's not there. As much as mathematicians would love to explain everything in purely mathematical terms, there are limits to the practical application of math in art. If Beethoven didn't consciously, deliberately use math in his compositions, let's not say he did. Or to the extent that he actually may have used some kind of extremely simple math, say, counting and measuring, why confuse matters by misrepresenting the actual process used by the composer? If counting and measuring was the limit of Beethoven's math ability, any assertion that he used, say, group theory in his compositions is preposterous. What he did was use structure, measure counts, time signatures, interval relationships. These and other musical terms are the language of music theory and all you need to understand musical structure. They can and should be understood in their own light. So a little history on the science of musical pitch relationships in Western music. An instrument known as the monochord was the standard mechanism for discerning the ratios of intervals of pitch since at least the year 500 BC, the days of the legendary mathematician, musician, and philosopher Pythagoras. The monochord is a simple box with a single string. The string is stopped by a movable bridge, the position of which, when changed, would produce different pitches. Comparing and measuring the different vibrating string lengths of each pitch facilitated the measurement of interval ratios between pitches. This was the basic math of tonality in Western music for over 2,000 years simply measuring the length of a vibrating string. This same logic could be applied to wind instruments by measuring the lengths of vibrating pipes. Just as with strings, there is a direct relationship between the length of, say, an organ pipe or a horn and its fundamental pitch. There was no such thing as frequencies of sound based on vibrations per second. First of all, there was no method of measuring vibrations per second, and in the days of Pythagoras, there was no such thing as a second of time. The second would not be accurately measured until the last half of the 16th century. It would be over a hundred years after that when musical pitches were measured by their frequency relative to seconds. This was first done by Joseph Sauveur in the early 1700s. Savoir counted the beats which occur when two closely tuned notes are sustained simultaneously and was able to calculate from the timing of these beats the actual vibrational frequencies of any audible pitch. While Savoir's work was a milestone in physics and useful to instrument makers, it was not eagerly adopted by the community of composers and musicians who had been getting along just fine without these new frequency measurements and would, by and large, continue to do so for quite some time. The measurements of pitch frequencies corresponds directly with the measurement of intervals using the physical ratios of string lengths. Frequency measurements provide a more precise method for refining the tuning of instruments and the study of timbre. But how useful is this knowledge in understanding the language of music theory. The fact is, knowing the mathematical ratios of intervals is not what we're concerned about when we describe intervals in the language of music theory anyway.
The octave is a 2 to 1 frequency ratio and a 2 to 1 ratio when measured on the string. Now how does the numbering of the diatonic system handle this idea of 2 to 1? Picture the numbered notes of a scale as a circle with C, note number 1, at the top. We label each alphabetical note until we return to C, which is either 8 or 1 depending on the context, or rather it's always both 8 and 1, but we decide which number to use for our musical purposes in a given moment. The number 8, the octave, is not multiplied by 2 when we go up another octave. It becomes an interval of a 15th, nor is it divided by 2 when going down an octave. The interval of half an octave falls between a perfect fourth and a perfect fifth. And it can be called a diminished fifth or an augmented fourth or a tritone. Sometimes it's called the devil's interval. The musical interval of a fifth, a three to two ratio, is not half of a tenth, but a combination of two thirds. Three thirds is a seventh, and a tenth is, of course, an octave and a third. Going up a fourth from the fifth of a scale brings us back to the octave. Now, if you're good at math and know nothing about music theory, this might sound like craziness. To understand how numbers are used in music theory, you have to think of it as a language, a technical language, which deals with the practice of making and playing music. It's not a mathematical language. Music theory tells us what notes to play when, how to combine chords and rhythms. It's a set of descriptions telling us how the mechanism and grammar of music works. It's a mechanism and a grammar that we learn on its own terms through practice and study. When I hear someone say music is math, I have to wonder what they think is meant by that. Are they just repeating a cliche? Of course, there are, in fact, plenty of musicians and composers who do use math, and this goes back to the days when the positions of the planets and the stars were believed to express a kind of divine geometry, which could be embodied in the form of music. The use of math continues in music today. Many basic structures of Western music, not to mention the music of many different cultures, are certainly in harmony with various mathematical formulations. So it would be wrong to ignore this fact. I'm not here to bash math, but as a teacher, I encounter a lot of people who struggle to understand music theory because someone told them that it was all about math. Music theory is not all about math. Patterns used in composition, rhythmic phrasing, repetition, modulations, variations on a theme, etc. Mathematical minds will always look for the math in these things, but consider Johann Sebastian Bach, a composer often associated with math, but who, like Beethoven, had only a basic math education. J.S. Bach's son, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, said that neither he nor his father nor any true musicians were lovers of that dry mathematical stuff. What we call music is a kind of organized sound. It's an expression of vibrational energy, rhythmic, structural, emotional, physical, and metaphysical. You can think of it any way you like. I'd say that music is just a part of our nature. It's part of our journey as humans. There are many ways to reach the desired destination when traveling from one place to another. For some, it's a mathematical journey. For some, it's a spiritual journey, an intuitive journey, painting and sculpting with sound. For some, it's all those things and more. Let's not fall into the trap of reducing art to one narrow definition.